One, two, three. Welcome to Skelta. My name is Joe Austin. And for those who have just joined us, can I remind you that is a joint production of Files Your Fears to Hear and Fail and Fubble. My guest this evening, uh, as you can see, and, you, and I'm sure you'll recognise him, is a former All-Ireland uh, Cruiseweight boxer and also a European Cruiseweight champion. And how many? Twice? You correct me where I'm wrong? Yep, no, you're right. Okay. Welcome. Welcome to Skelta. Uh, it's good to see you. So, you're looking very fit, I have to say. Thanks very much. So, how are things with you? Ah, brilliant, you know, just um, still chasing the dream. Just training and trying to do a ring what's right there that will become a world champion. Next time we're on, I want you to say we have world champion, not just European. The next time I'm interviewing, it'll be world champion. Yep, that's weird. That's weird. If that is weird. That's weird. I had been doing some research about you and about your life and, and all of that. And I have to say that what you come across is much more than a boxer. I have to say that you're someone who, I was actually told this morning you're very quiet, you're hard to, to get a conversation out of. Now that hasn't been our experience since we've been getting ready for this interview. Mm. But for, for those that don't know you, uh, where does Tommy McCarthy begin? So tell us about about growing up and where you're from. Um, for the, well, where I begin, I suppose you probably have to go back to my parents or yeah. even my grandparents. So my father is, as most people, on the road with know Tom McCarthy and um he went to England when he was about eighteen and for work as a lot of young Irish fellas do and um my mother was in London and her parents came to London from Jamaica. Yeah. Um as part of part of the Windrush. So uh, my mother and father met when we were young. As I say, my, my, my daddy was about 18. They were the same age anyway. And we um, started going with each other and my mother got pregnant with me. And uh, so when I was born, and I um, was actually born in London. And so I, w I was born there after six weeks. My daddy brought me home. My mum and daddy brought me home to get christened up in Oliver Plunkett in, in Lanadine. So that was um, the early stages of my life was, you know, back and forward between Belfast and, and London. And um, my parents broke up when I was probably about three or four. My daddy came home and um, I stayed with my mummy in, in London. And, but still, I was still back and forward that time and then when just before my, I turned eight my, my mother passed away yeah. and um so when I came home to live full time with my grandparents over here Mary and Tommy up in Lanadine and can I ask you and I, and I, and I read in the past I read it, an interview done in the past when you talked about when your mother died your life completely changed for anybody at that age, of course, it must be a, a, a traumatic experience losing your mother or your father, but, but your mother. Were you, for, did it appear then at that stage that you would be a Londoner, that you would be growing up with your mother and your mother's family? Was that kind of what you were settling into? So like, I was obviously so young, so I don't, I never even really, thought too much about you know like my identity like what am i even like you know I've, my mother's black and my father's white and i can remember like when i was in london all my cousins were all black you know mother and father and then i didn't even really have there, none of my cousins were born yet over here so i was like the only grandchild in in belfast and then in london there was, there was loads of us so Obviously, um, you know, was the latest, latest complexion of all my all my cousins, and I used to go right. This side, this side's white, and this side's black. That's you no know, like a kid, like I know. And then the my cousins, even though we're all in London, like I was, 
the Irish cousin. Yeah. Because I was always back and forward from Ireland, like, and I was always, like, so proud to be Irish. And even, you know, like, um, as a kid, like, I was, it was, like, drilled into me to hate England, you know, like, hate England football, hate anything that England do. And even, I, I remember when I was in, like, P1, maybe P1 or two, and, and the World Cup was on. 98, the World Cup 98, in um, England. I can't remember what I got to, but I remember in, in school, they brought the TV in in the assembly so everyone could come and watch England and support all the kids. And everyone was going, oh, God, yeah, I love it. England won, and I was just sitting there again. <laughs> and I was like, come on, man. I was like, nah, I'm not English. <laughs> but like, and see the thing about it too, it wasn't like, London's a mountain pot, mountain pot, so I was like, there's loads of kids, and my, like being so young too, there was loads of us in the class who were born in London, but we didn't identify with, with England and didn't claim England. Like it was my best mate in the class was called Demetri, and he was like Greek, and then there was girls and you know like from pa their parents were from Pakistan and. Um, African children and Jamaican children, just children from all around the world in the one class, and um, so it wasn't like on it wasn't like as if I was being a weirdo, yeah. like claiming a country that I wasn't going to school in. You know what I mean? But um, I never, all that you know, being a Londoner or being a Belfast, or being a Lana Dooner, it didn't. I'd, I always felt like I was a land dooner anyway, even when I lived in London, because it was always home, very regular. But um, it's like, at the, when I was a kid, I was always coming home on weekends or school holidays. So it was always fun times, you know, when I was coming. And then I used to cry going back to London, because I was going back to Paris, so to speak. You know, I had a great, great memories growing up in London. But um, I was like, I just, would love to live here because all my wee friends, you know. You, but you, you mentioned Windrush, mm. and for anybody who doesn't know, it was a particularly harsh decision that was taken by the British government. The Windrush people who came were guaranteed passports, guaranteed employment, came from Jamaica, and all of that. And then when it when it suited the British government, they just cut them off as if they were had no rights and tried to rescind passports and all that. I know from reading about you that you're particularly proud of your Jamaican background and of course, why wouldn't you be? Does that come through your contact with your mother? Did you know anything about Jamaica? You're only, only eight when your mommy died, so had you just got a sense of that's, that's who you are, that's the norm, or did you uh, get a sense of it? Well, um, my, my grandfather's uh, a preacher like in in a church right and he so i used to go to his church the whole family used to go to the church every sunday but just now growing up when i look at it like the church was was almost like a social club yeah. for all jamaicans and and west indians like that was when they when they got to england they were getting tortured yeah, of course. by you know um Skinheads and uh, what do you call them? Mods and all. Nice little yeah, yeah. friend. Yeah. My grandma, um, has, you know, has millions of stories. They were all getting tortured. So the church was like the safe haven. So it's like a, it was like a social club. Just all, so all Jamaicans all every, get the guy every week, and every day there was always something like. My grandmother, my grandmother would be in church every day, they were like Bible studies, prayer meetings, or something going on. But it really just friends getting together and keeping what they had going in Jamaica, keeping it going in England. So you just, I just grew up around that. When all all my elders were all Jamaicans, like all, they all had all have Jamaican accents. We were eating Jamaican food. Like it was just like. I said it there, I was in London last month and I was talking to my granny about it and I was like, when I come to England, like, it's not like 
I'm coming to England. It's like I may as well be going to Jamaica because we're just here in our own wee Caribbean community, just eating food from from back home and you know, just the way people's talking, like you it's not like being in England. I couldn't tell you like what to do in England because I just go to one wee yeah. one yeah. wee part. So we always had that thing you know, like the Jamaican thing and it's no like around us like no, yeah identity and we're all from young we've always been proud of it but I think like I said I was a kid over when I was living there so you, you know it's you don't really pay much attention to it you just think it's just normal and then it wasn't until then when I started going to school here it's like people asked me where are you from well Lana don't know but where are you from or London no but where are you really from and it's like where am I really from? So then I had to really either own it or try and shy away from it. Which a lot of people outsiders, especially kids trying to fit in, they'll try and you know like disregard what's different about them to try and fit in with the rest yeah, yeah. of them. Whereas I went the opposite way and was like, you know, I'm I'm a proud Jamaican and you know like really took ownership of it. You're described in the Irish Times as a proud black man who's Irish, who boxes, who's going to be a world champion, and who lives in West Belfast. You can't be bad. You couldn't be bad with that. Yeah. Your mother died when you reached your back in West Belfast. And you mentioned some of that experience. And the trauma of your mother dying and then being brought away from your family, your, your Jamaican part of your family, albeit that you're coming to the Irish part of your family. Well, school, for a black kid, was it difficult? Was was it a battle in the day? Did you have to defend yourself? I don't mean even physically. I mean, did you have to defend your identity every day, or was it, really, we just accepted? Not really. You know, at, at the start, it was because, like I said, when, from six weeks old, I've been coming back and forward. So in Lanadun, I had my friend group and. Uh, so, like, when I used to come visit, they used to go, my friends used to say, oh, you should move here and you can be in my class and we'll go to school. And so, like, I knew teachers' names. No, I remember going up when I was going to Alva Plunkett. I asked, can I be in Miss Dugan's class? Mm. Because I knew all my mates were in Miss Dugan's class, so they just uh, stuck me in a class next door. Well, it was, like, a big, like, mad thing of excitement all yes Tommy goes to our school it wasn't even a racing because we were all young like so and I had my hair and plaits so I was young so it was all people were intrigued by me if they didn't yeah, know me of course, yeah. and um but I like enjoyed it because I'm an only child as well and like so it says on my Ari said I was the only grandchild for ages and the first black grandchild and then on my mummy said I was I'm one of the youngest, but um, like there's a thing, I don't know, it's like a wee bit of colorism, you no, know, in the black community where like the the favor, favor you a wee bit more if you're later. My cousins always slag me about it because I'm, oh, granny only loves you because you're so late. <laughs> but Reverse I was, racism? Yeah, uh, but I was always, you know, like in like the center of attention of like my both grandparents favorite on both sides and all my aunties. I think it's mostly because I'm an only child as well. I could stay with everyone. So I always enjoyed being in the, the spotlight. So when I got the Albert Plunkett and everyone was, you know, like all, it was all friendly, it was all good. And then as we got a wee bit older, then it got a, a bit harder, but it, it wasn't as bad as what some people who I've spoke to have said, but I was always, you know, kind of popular. And, and, and then when I started boxing in, that gave me more of a thing of people wanting, you no, know, like, respecting me more. Like, it, was, it wasn't too difficult, but it did have hard times. Clear up a mystery for me. We have interviewed on scale the, a number of boxers. And I have to say this, you're a big lump, right? <laughs> I'd let you in downstairs and I'm... I'm looking up at you from inside and you're coming in. You're a big lump. I think there's a misunderstanding. This is my view. There's a misunderstanding where people who box. People who box are not necessarily trying to prove anything other than love boxing. 
and there's there's a gentleness about you, and as I say, you're a cruiserweight, you're a big, you're a big guy, and all of that. Was boxing for you to prove a point, or was it the sport? No, not at all. Um, I was always, you know, let us say, I'm, I'm an only child, and so no brother, no most most the the age old stories. My brother boxed, so I followed him, and like my uncles. Uh, have one. My daddy had one brother. He never boxed. He was a kickboxer, but there was no like thing of boxing in my family. We were That's just true. casual yeah. fans. You know what I mean? And um, I always just I don't know why. I just always wanted to box. And then because of, as you say, I'm a big lump. I've always been a big lump from from I was a kid. But my dad thought I would have been fighting older people because it was no too big and too heavy. But he started working with Shane Steeds, and who was who was a boxing yeah. coach in Alva Plunkett, and um, Shane Steeds brought me to a club, and that it was nothing to do with like I wasn't getting a hard time at that time running or what, what it was getting bullied. I was just going on twelve. It was when I went in the first year in school. And did boxing become? Did it become your life? Did it? W I mean, it's a it's a very hard discipline. Yeah, straight away, like it was. The first day I went there, I just loved it. As soon as I opened the door, just like the noise and the smell and all, just everything, I just loved it. And like, cause it was, I just went in the first year, and so everything's new, new school and new people. So I didn't feel intimidated or anything, cause it, every, it was just. Like I'm starting a new chapter in my life, so I went up and I was introducing myself to the lads, and it was just, it was a, it was a perfect time. I think that that is the perfect time to to join a boxing club when you go in the first year, because you're almost reinventing yourself, you know, or not reinventing yourself, but like making new friends yeah. everywhere. Yeah. So it's not a daunting task, and um, I just loved it straight away. Did you like school? I love school. Were you good at school? I was, uh, uh, do you know what, I was good in school up until about third year and that's when I decided I want to go, uh, like, I have no interest in being an academic, I want to be a professional boxer. So then I just never really took school serious, but I still enjoyed it, like, it was, I, had, I would actually love to go to school now for a week, just, just to relive it, we had, it was fun every day, like, and, um, but I just, I never took it serious because I decided in third year to put all my eggs in, in one basket. When you say that you, you that you wanted to be a professional boxer, which of course you became, and you wanted to be a champion, which of course you became, was it like a revelation or was it something that just give it a lot of thought and you, have a talk, you talked it over with your friends or your trainer or with your father or it's just, this is, about, yeah, this is where I am. Um, just just talking to myself, really. Like, you know, as a as an only child, you do spend a lot of time on your own. So, you know, you there's loads of time for reflecting and you know, like thinking about the future and what you want to do. So, when I started boxing, I was already playing for Guatemala, hurling football, and and um, my my goal was always red. Right. When I grew up, I wanted to play for Anthem. It was always a big thing. And then I was like, I could be the first black man to play for Anthem. That was <laughs> in my mind. And then I was playing the guitar as well. And, and then my granda said to me when I was 14, he was like, look, come here. You're doing all this stuff. You need to put all your effort into one yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, so there's no point trying to do 20% here, 30% here, 100% in one thing. If you stick with GAA, it'll get you to Dublin. If you stick with boxing, you'll get around the world. And that's a, it was a great thing, but he, he didn't even want me to box. He wanted me to keep playing GAA and, and, and play guitar, but I think he was just being a realist. So when I, when I made the decision in my mind, right, I'm taking boxing all the way, I was just, uh, that year then I won the, my first all Ireland title. And then I was like, do you know what? I, just want to do this forever. Yeah. Uh, I was hooked. You, you mentioned your main there, and there's a quotation from another interview that I read about you, and we talked about the biggest battle 
been the, the battle to convince yourself that you are the best. Um, are you? Do you lack confidence? Do you? You seem to me to be a quite reserved, nearly shy. But is it is it a battle to keep convincing yourself? I'm the well, best. Look, yeah, that is a that is a battle. The believe because you know what? It's a weird thing where I know how good I am, and like. I know I'm not kidding myself when I say I want to be a world champion, and I, and everyone who's shared a ring with me and no, well, like it's it's not like a, a pipe dream, but there's just a overthinking, and then I'll be second guessing. I'll be going sometimes. Am I am I good? I think everyone goes to it, but I need to just work on like hundred percent belief because. Yeah. If you let any doubts in, then that makes room for mistakes. And that, any time that I've lost. The very few I've occasions, put, yeah, I have to say. Yeah. The very few occasions. It, it's been, not because the person is better than me, it's been me in my own mind during the fights, you know what I mean? And getting, instead of just, you know, getting these doubts away. And it's, it, it, it's hard, like, I I'm not saying, like, I don't have mental, no, of course il not. mental illness or anything like that, but it's just, you know, just being 100% confident. And I'm not, like, I am a confident person, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not a shy person, but I just need to be, like, 100% confident, you know what I mean? Can, can you remember your first win? Uh, you know, when you were boxing, not as a, not as a wee boy, but when you were boxing seriously, can you can you imagine? Can you remember? Sorry, how that felt? Yeah, well, see, when I was a wee lad, my first win, I lost my first fight, but that's you know commonplace in boxing because you know the yeah, stick in, yeah, yeah, and usually put you in with someone with more experience. But I loved it, and even though I get beat, I just was buzzing anyway, and then. I got to walk over around the, the national championships because it was too big, there was nobody in Andrew. My I say, he's at that age. And um, so my, my, I got a straight bay until the semi final. I was fighting this fella, Patrick J. Ward, and he was the Irish champion from, bef from the year before. Mm. And this was only my second fight. And I remember, you know, like kids, the, the way they're trying to sick each other. Out. So I remember talking to him before, he was like, how many fights have you had? He's like, 20. <laughs> that I had one. And he's like, when have you had? And he was like, oh, I've had 30. 30 knockouts. And he's like, no, I have 20 knockouts. No, no, just talking crap. So we get in and well, box was such a hard fight. And at the end, I thought I lost. And it was four each. So I went to count back and I was just like, man, where are the feelings still there? I was like, fuck's sake. I guess boxing is now for me. You're getting lost and twice in a row now. McCarthy in the blue corner and I had Jesus I won. And then so my next fight was in the Irish final. So it was buzzing in. And um like that would have been some fight to win an Irish title in your third fight. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I don't even box in a few months. So I got beat by two points. But in the last ten seconds I got two points took off me. So I got beat eight six. But even though I was gullet and cried my eyes out, but that gave me so much belief, like, I'm actually good enough to do this. And then, so I had, I had to kick me on. I want to jump from boxing just to, to your, your family life, and, and you're very much a family man. You have four daughters, God help you. God <laughs> help you. Oh, no, I, I, I have two and twos. Like, oh, two's no. enough. <laughs> so, Amy, tell me a bit about Amy. Well, Amy, I met Amy when in P, P4, when I had just had like moved from London to here, went to Alvaro Plunkett and I said earlier, I asked to be in Miss Dugan's class and Miss Dugan was her teacher because all my friends were in her class. So it's funny the way things work out and because um, all my friends from my granny suit were in, were in her class, I, for the first lot of weeks, would you know like go to her class in the yard and all, I don't even know how I started talking to her, but we were always friends through primary school, and and then her 
cousin is still this day one of my, one of my best friends. So uh, growing up as teenagers, it was always like stay away from my R A M E. Anyone goes there, R A M E, go through them. Or Donald, he said, they, uh, hey, come give a fuck if it was your dad. If anyone goes in the air, I ain't going through. And then, years, years down the line, then, Donald come up to me one night and says, hey, you're looking for a girl, aren't you? And I says, oh, anyway, I know a girl who's looking for a fella. She likes a bit of time, mate. I went, fuck, I fudged you. And he went, no, or Amy. I went, bait, are you serious? He went, oh, ask me to bait it. And he went, Seriously, go and talk there, but don't talk there if you're not serious. So then the man up told her, and I was like, well, what's a crack? And then, and then the rest is history. You never look back? Never look back. And, and how does she deal with your boxing? Does she, is she, does she know about boxing? I she loves it. Like, we're going to each other from, well, she knows me from we're kids. Aye, but so that, she, yeah. she knows me, like, boxing has always been my number one. And then from ever, like, from... From we've been going with her, I've always been going to Dublin because you still have to go to Dublin. Yes. At the start, it was Wednesday to Saturday, and yeah. then it changed Tuesday to Friday. So it's down the camp. Down, down the, the camp, camp every week. Yeah. And um, so it's just it's just her life. Like it's, it's she don't know any different. But do you know the way you see, and this is probably what you see in the films as opposed to what. So you see Rocky, and you see his wife, and and every five minutes is telling them. Leave box and get a job as a taxi driver. <laughs> none of that. No, that, no. That would melt your head. Surely. Definitely, definitely. Um, Does she give you advice? Does she tell you you're eating too much or not eating? I. She sometimes she would like, and um, I would go to her for advice sometimes because she is the one person who genuinely has your my best interests at heart, and um, yeah, no, she's very, very um, supportive and wants me to reach my potential and believes that I can be a world champion, so she, she supports me all the way. You have a birthday coming up, one of the girls' birthday? You tomorrow, four. yeah. Oh, yeah. tomorrow? Yeah. Well, <laughs> happy birthday from us <laughs> to you. How you doing? Happy birthday, Brahma. <laughs> tell, tell me about the girls, your four girls, what ages are they? Uh, four, Car is 14, Brahma will be 11 tomorrow, and now is 3 and Kai is 2. Did none of the older girls boxing? No, you know, see when I was younger, with, with the older two, like female boxing wasn't what it is today. today. Mm -hmm. Just Katie, I used to tra I know Katie for and years and we used to train with her. Well done, and her yeah. father trains me now. Yeah. So Katie was the only female boxer who I thought was like, could do anything. And see really looking back in, that. There was no one, and there still is no one in Katie's league, but back then there was no one that could even come close to her. So I was like, it's an un unrealistic um, target for for me to expect, because I've seen how good Katie is, so like, I don't think my two girls would ever be able to be as good as her, because look at all these other girls, yeah. and they can't get close to her. So I never really fought, pushed it on them, and then, as well, I, growing up with my grandparents and being in a boxing club with Patsy McAllister, an yeah. old school yeah. trainer, like nobody ever championed female boxing. And it's like, oh, it's, like it's not a female sport. I would, so I would try to push them in the dancing, no, no, like stereo, yeah. gender stereotypes. But now with these younger two, two and three, like. I would. I'm not opposed. I would want them to box yeah, if. It's their and choice. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about, you know, when they get a bit bigger, about bring them down because, it is. It is good. It's a great sport, and the female thing is the female boxing is flying. So. And, and I know you're not here to talk about anybody else, any other boxers, because that would be unfair. But when I, when you mentioned Katie Taylor, your eyes lit up. Um, and I don't know a whole lot about boxing. I know a wee bit about it, and I like it, and all that. Is she, very, is she that good? Is she as good as you're just... Yeah, like, Katie... Like, uh, nobody can even dispute this. She's the greatest female fighter of all time. And it'll be a long time before anyone can come and emulate what she's done and take over what she's done. Like, she's just unreal. She's 
who could you compare her to? Like, she's like the Usain Bolt of mm. female boxing. You know what I mean? There's be a long time before anyone reaches that head. You mentioned her father, uh, who's your trainer. Mm -hmm. What always struck me again about boxing and about boxers is that everybody wants to be the guy in the ring who's just won. Everybody wants to be the guy that's putting his hands up and, and, and hasn't got a mark on him and hasn't got a black guy and his nose isn't bleeding. But the regime is torture. I, don't, I was yeah. trying to find a word there for it. That's a good the word other, for it. The other thing that, 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 that always struck me about boxing more than any other sport is that boxers are seem to be put on pedestals by everyone and then they start kicking them off. You mm -hmm. know, so, so tell me a wee bit about, you talked about camp and, and how camp had changed for you. You used to travel every day, I think. You, you travel, or you come home at the weekends. Yeah, you? yeah. So tell me what camp consists of. What is it like? It's, it's boring. Like it's not. It's not much goes on. You get up in the morning, check your weight, get your every breakfast day. every day. Get up in the morning, check your weight, get your breakfast, go for your first session, come home, get your lunch, have a sleep, go and do your second session, come back. I like the weight on my dinner because you train. Well, we train at eleven o'clock and two o'clock. So after the two o'clock session, if you come home and you get your dinner, say you got it flipping five o'clock, like then the rest of, you're not eating the rest of the day, and so it's like, and you're bored as well, or just sitting in your hotel room. So I like to leave it till later on, so I have something to look forward to, and then and then till it doesn't literally nothing happens. What is the session? Is it road running or in the ring or both? Or the, some some boxers. You know, love the roads. I've never been a fan of road running from the first week I joined a boxing club. So I would do all my running on a treadmill. So the the morning sessions would be either sparring, the boxing session we call it. So it's sparring, bags, pods, either you no know, one of them in the morning, and then in the second session would be treadmill or weights. So. Yeah. Do you ever feel like saying, I'm not on, I'm not getting up? Oh, every morning. <laughs> <laughs> good. That's a good answer. Because uh, it's, it's work at the end of the day. Like, it's like, and you know you're going the, the bust your balls. Yeah. It's like, very rarely you'll be buzzing to go up for the torture, as yeah. you said. Maybe that makes you all that more dedicated. That yeah, it that is. Like the, do. Um, it's not the the motivation because your the motivation is usually low in the mornings for anything so it's the discipline really is, is, is the difference and then you're i'm personally i'm always buzzing in after the season i was like that was a great season but when i wake up in the morning it's like huh? jesus yeah, well. even i'd be dreading looking at the skills because you're going hopefully i'm down and then sometimes you just your weight's sitting there for ages or sometimes you go up and pound and you're going fuck but there's, not, there's no frills of being in camp. I, I mentioned at the very beginning that you were a European champion. That wasn't predicted. That, that, in fact, I, I think that you kind of surprised a whole lot of people when you took that title. Was it a different league altogether? Was it hard, harder? Do you know what? Like when, when I turned pro, it was always kind of like a mess. And um, you know, like with a coaching team and all, and got like I bounced from different coach, coach to coach, and then uh, I, I lost the year before. Was no two years before one of the the title I lost the fight that I should have won. So then I was like, you know, I got an opportunity to fight for an international title in Italy. So I was like, you know what, this is the last chance saloon. Let me make sure there's no excuses. So I linked up with Pete Taylor mm -hmm. and was, we were training, like see fighting for an international title. In my mind, in the camp we had, it was like fighting for a world title. Yeah. So the next fight after it was for the European title. So it was just to continue, it was just up in the ante from where we went, but we came in, like it was a different league. Everything was a different ball game, just intensity, work, everything. So. 
it was just it was great because as you say I had been written off and then the finally win that European title which is a major title like it was yeah, like of course it is, fucking yeah. right it wasn't and I, it wasn't a feeling of like I told you so it was a feeling of like personal vindication like mm. I'm not kidding myself like I know I am good enough We've been talking for a wee while and, and, and I'm going to end the interview by, by asking you for the future. So I know you're training, I know you're having a birthday, I know you're not having a day off and I know you're doing all that. So what, where, are you, where do you go from here? What, what's your immediate objective apart from being, which you will be, a world champion? So what is the next thing in front of you? Well, um, the next, I would like to... I have a fight before the end of the year, a good fight for, um, you know, to try and win an Intercontinental title. And then after that, I would like the fight for a world title next year. Do you remember actually the trick question when you won your first fight and you said how you felt? Is that buzz still there? Oh, every time, like this, there's, see, the win a boxing fight mm. it's the highest high and then when there's a belt attached to the championship it's just the earliest world but the lose is the lowest lowest yeah. like it's like somebody down it's, it's, it's terrible so you've always said how proud you are of an Irish and black being from Belfast and all of that and obviously you know everybody's so proud of you and you've done us all justice. And, and even reading stuff last night about you and, and trying to get trying to get a sense of you, it's clear that you're nobody's fool. It's clear that you're your own man. Uh, and for all those reasons, Tommy, I, I'm confident, and I know you are, that you're going to be our champion and then we're going to celebrate in West Belfast. Yeah, touch wood again. Touch wood. <laughs> so listen from Skilda for giving me your time. Keep up the training. If you see me in the ring, give us a wave and I let everybody know you're my best friend. <laughs> so thank you from Skilta. Yeah, thanks for having me.